A very good evening, my dear friends. Good evening to all of you. Today we are here for the session in ophthalmology in the series of 25 important questions, which is provided by MIST. Good evening, everyone. I give you a very hearty welcome to today's session in which we'll be discussing 25 important clinical based ophthalmology questions around the topics which we expect in the exam. A very good evening to all of you. The purpose of this session, my dear friends, is to take you through your ophthalmology once again, to revise all the important things with you once again, and at the same time to let you know that the way you have studied and the way you have prepared, how it is going to reflect in your exam. Okay. Hope all of you are doing well. Hope all of you are in your positive frame of mind. Exam is close by and it should be the time when you are giving your best shot at preparation. Okay, okay, wonderful, wonderful, my dear friends. So without any delay any uh, further, I would like to start today's session. Let's begin the session of 25 clinical based ophthalmology questions important for your upcoming exam on 30th of July. Starting with the first question, my dear friends, starting with the que first question. Now, as you, you know, read these questions with me, try to see how, try to imagine yourself that you are in an exam room, okay? You are in an exam room and when you're attempting the question in exam, how will you be doing it? Okay, your approach to this session while doing the questions should be that how you are going to attempt this question as it is coming in your exam. Is it okay? Right? Okay, perfect. Yes, absolutely. So starting with your first question here, let's read the statement. A 65-year-old patient develops sudden loss of vision. So as I have been always telling you, when you read a question statement, try to first of all see what is the nature of the question. Here it is an image based question with a clinical history. Now, whenever there is an image, whenever there is a clinical history, try to see the key points, the key features, the key words in the question statement, which can lead you to the answer. At the same time, try to, of course, identify the diagnosis from the image. That's the purpose of the question. So let's read the statement first. A 65-year-old patient develops sudden loss of vision. So important point here is he is an elderly patient. Okay. There is a sudden loss of vision. And on fundus examination, the following findings are seen. This patient should be immediately tested for which of the following, right? So here, first part of the question is that you have to identify the diagnosis based upon the fundus image. Because of these fundus findings, the person has developed painless sudden loss of vision. Painless is not mentioned here. Sudden loss of vision is mentioned. Now, let's go to the fundus image. So, dear friends, I have been showing these important fundus images to you very often and whenever we look at it, any fundus image, what we need to do, we have to look at the fundus image step by step. So first of all, what you will see, you will look at the optic nerve, right? You will look at the optic nerve. So optic nerve, what are the findings in the optic nerve here? You are able to see that there are hemorrhages on the optic nerve, but otherwise the optic nerve is not swollen. There are hemorrhages, but there is no swelling of the optic nerve. Okay. The second point is coming to the blood vessels. So what is happening to the blood vessels here? All the blood vessels are dilated and tortuous. All these vessels, the veins, they are appearing dilated and tortuous. Right. And then the thing which is flashing onto your face is that whole of the fundus is having these multiple 
retinal hemorrhages, both flame shaped as well as dot and blot hemorrhages. The whole of the retina is splattered with the hemorrhages as if somebody splashed a tomato on the retina. So very right. It is a tomato splash appearance of the fundus. Absolutely right. Your diagnosis is absolutely right. It is a case of central retinal vein occlusion. Okay. I'm sure none of you will mark a central retinal vein occlusion wrong because you know how to make a diagnosis of central retinal vein occlusion on the fundus image. Okay, so diagnosis is done. Now come to the question. Come to the question what the examiner is asking. The question is, this patient should be immediately tested for which of the following? Choices are high blood pressure, tuberculosis, high cholesterol, increased intracranial pressure. So they are asking you to identify the risk factor for central retinal vein occlusion among these choices. So what is the most important and common risk factor for development of Central retinal vein occlusion, absolutely right, my dear friends. It is, no, no, uh, don't confuse with high cholesterol. We have to mark the choice which is best. Yes, high cholesterol can be risk factor. But the most important one, most important one is yes. Your choice A, high blood pressure. Uncontrolled high blood pressure, hypertension is the major risk factor for vein occlusions. Please remember this. Yes, there can be various other factors, atherosclerosis, emboli, inflammation, but the most important will be high blood pressure. Okay? Of course, tuberculosis, high cholesterol, they are not appropriate choices here. Increased intracranial pressure will lead to disc edema, which is known as papilledema. Okay, increased intracranial pressure will lead to passive swelling of the optic nerve, which is called papilledema and not the central retinal vein occlusion. Okay, perfect. So here, what we, what's the purpose? What this question made you learn? To make a diagnosis of central retinal vein occlusion, to know the risk factor for central retinal vein occlusion and other thing which you want to remember based what else they can ask? A complication. What, what is an important complication of central retinal vein occlusion? That is the development of neovascular glaucoma. A complication which you should remember from your exam point of view. That is neovascular glaucoma. And that is typically known as 90-day or 100-day glaucoma. So this is a kind of an old question which they have been asking that in which condition you will be seeing 90 day or 100 day glaucoma. That is a type of neovascular glaucoma which you see in central retinal vein occlusion. Okay, so all of us are clear about the answer to this question. Choice A, hypertension. Yes, absolutely right, my dear friends. Okay, then I'll take this question at the same time let's revise if it is not the whole retina which is filled with the blood but with a similar looking situation when you see retinal hemorrhages only in one quadrant of the retina one sector of the retina then the condition is called branch retinal vein occlusion then the condition is called branch retinal vein occlusion okay Similar things, retinal hemorrhages, multiple retinal hemorrhages, but in one quadrant, then your diagnosis will be branch retinal vein occlusion. Again, the risk factor here remains hypertension. Then another important retinal vascular disease, which you must identify on the basis of your fundus picture, that is, what, what are you looking at this fundus picture here, beta? this one? What, what are you looking at this picture here? The thing again, go one by one, the optic disc, how the optic disc is looking, it is looking pale, right? The whole of the retina is looking pale and in the center, you are finding a cherry red spot. Yes. Again, this should be a fundus image, which none of you should forget, which none of you should mark wrong if it comes in the exam. Okay. So they can ask the question in multiple ways. They can ask the the question that you see a pale 
retina with cherry red spot a pale retina with cherry red spot diagnosis is central retinal artery occlusion central retinal artery occlusion okay and what is the most important risk factor for central retinal artery occlusion they are the emboli with due to thromboembolic disease all the risk factors for stroke will be the risk factors for central retinal artery occlusion also okay so you have revised your retinal vascular diseases you have revised your questions based upon that yes you will see the cattle truck appearance of the blood vessels because of the interrupted blood flow due to an embolus due to an embolus perfect very happy with you guys right so let's move on to our next question let's move on to our next question right again an image a clinical case scenario ready let's read the next question now a patient presents with pain redness and decreased vision so what are the symptoms of the patient patient is having pain redness of the eye and decreased vision now friends whenever there is painful red eye and decreased vision what you should think of right now decreased vision painful red eye there are three diagnoses which you should keep in mind right three kind of condition one is it can be a corneal ulcer painful red eye with decreased vision can be a corneal ulcer painful red eye with decreased vision can be a case of anterior uveitis painful red eye with decreased vision can be in acute angle closure glaucoma so these are three basic things which which you should remember if the question statement has painful red eye decreased vision okay you got me once again it can be a corneal ulcer it can be a case of acute anterior uveitis it can be acute angle closure glaucoma so of course if this is the thing now we have to see next what else is given to us now on examination the given lesion is seen there is an image lesion shown corneal sensations are found to be reduced right so coming to your diagnosis here beta coming to your diagnosis here again most of you are absolutely spot on all of you are spot on wonderful so you are seeing here there is a red eye but at the same time there is a lesion in the cornea and what type of the lesion classic dendritic lesion classic dendritic lesion dendritic ulcer so this is the dendritic ulcer this is the dendritic ulcer or dendritic keratitis keratitis and ulcer both are in inflammation of cornea in ulceration there is always epithelial abrasion along with or epithelial defect that is the difference between keratitis and ulcer right and yes the cause of dendritic ulcer is viral which viral this kind of typical dendritic ulcer with true dendrites is herpes simplex virus right again very happy all of you have made your diagnosis based upon the clinical case statement and the image now coming to the questions once one you once you have identified this what is the question which of the following drugs is absolutely contraindicated in this case so here they want you to identify the drug which is absolutely contraindicated not to be given which of the drug acv drops steroid eye drops atropin lubricants so what do you think my dear friends see some of you are missing the question statement which of the drug is absolutely contraindicated i'm not asking the the examiner is not asking about the treatment yes the treatment is acvir or acyclovir eye ointment but which one is contraindicated which one yes some of you are right some of you are not let me tell you steroid eye drops are absolutely contraindicated steroid you will never give steroid in case of active dendritic ulcer active dendritic ulcer beta steroid drops are contraindicated okay 
So why? So once again, let me just tell you in the treatment of any corneal ulcer, in the treatment of any corneal ulcer, the number one thing which you will do is to give antimicrobial. If it is bacterial ulcer, you will give antibiotic. If it is viral ulcer, you will give antiviral. If it is fungal ulcer, you will give antifungal. Okay. So you will be giving antimicrobial. In this case, it is a cyclovir. Then you will be giving a cycloplegic like atropin. Why do you want to give cycloplegic? Because that helps in reducing the inflammation as well as it helps in reducing the pain, which is due to ciliary muscle spasm. Okay. And of course, you can give adjuvant agents, for example, lubricants, vitamin C. So they are adjuvants just to promote healing and lubricants. They provide the kind of like, you know, comfort from the irritation which a patient may be feeling. So these are the things which you will be giving. But steroids are contraindicated. Steroids are contraindicated because they can lead to worsening of the infection. They can lead to worsening of the infection. In dendritic ulcer, if you give steroid, it can move on to development of geographic ulcer. So steroids, my dear friends, I hope all of you are... No, dendritic ulcers are not painless when we tell that corneal sensations are reduced. That does not mean that it is painless. Okay. The pain in the corneal ulcer is because of the ciliary muscle spasm. Fine, bitter, Right? So, absolutely, contraindication among these drugs will be steroid eye drops. So, what you have revised here, you have revised your dendritic ulcer, how the dendritic ulcer looks like. You know the features. There will be reduced corneal sensation. It is due to viral keratitis herpes simplex virus, the, in the treatment, you must avoid steroid, which actually is for any kind of active corneal ulcer with epithelial involvement. Yes, absolutely right. Wonderful. So your concepts are clear. I'm very happy to know that your concepts are clear. You know what is the reason for your answer. Wonderful. Okay, moving on to your next question, Beta. Moving on to your next question. Let's read the question statement. A seven-year-old girl complains of difficulty in seeing blackboard in the school. So again, keep looking at the important points. A young girl is having difficulty in seeing blackboard in the school. Means the distance vision, the far vision is not clear. Okay. She was prescribed glasses. Okay, They checked her, they prescribed her glasses. But vision in the right eye did not improve beyond 618. So you give the glass prescription, the vision should improve, but it did not improve beyond 618 in one of the eye, in the right eye. What should be the next step in the management? So before telling the management, dear friends, what is the diagnosis? Very nice. The diagnosis here is amblyopia. Very good. What is that diagnosis here? The diagnosis is amblyopia. What is amblyopia? When the vision is not improving, when there is suppression of the vision due to non-organic cause, the refractive errors was corrected, but still the patient is not able to see clearly. That is because of the suppressed vision. This suppression of the vision is called amblyopia. And the best treatment for amblyopia is, as all of you have told me, occlusion therapy. Perfect. Occlusion therapy. Okay. So what is occlusion therapy, beta? Occlusion therapy means that you patch the normal eye. Okay. You patch the normal eye so that the eye which is suppressed is stimulated. Okay. So that the eye which is suppressed is stimulated. So occlusion therapy is the treatment of choice for amblyopia. Okay? So whether they ask you a straightforward question, 
like what is the treatment of amblyopia or best treatment or they ask you a question like this so here the patient is myopic she was given glasses but maybe because of anisometropia that is the difference in the refractive error between two eyes she has amblyopia lasik is not indicated we are not looking at refractive surgery the age is 7 year old observation if you do not do anything the vision will be suppressed for life so that's not the right answer whether you give glasses or you give contact lenses it has to be with along with that given occlusion therapy yes you can put the atropin also but that that's called as penalization but preferred treatment is occlusion therapy so we do give low dose atropin eye drops that therapy is called penalization but occlusion therapy is the best okay that's the 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 treatment of the choice for amblyopia is that all right okay perfect yes okay dear friends moving on to the next question all going very fine perfect moving on to the next question again a clinical case scenario let's read the question statement with me a female presents with painful red eye which is stony hard to touch okay so what is the statement again the patient is having a painful red eye which is stony hard to touch the eye is hard like a stone after examination diagnosis of acute congestive glaucoma is made so examiner has already given you the diagnosis this patient why the eye is stony hard that is because of very high intraocular pressure the very high intraocular pressure the patient was diagnosed as acute congestive glaucoma patient is given appropriate treatment okay you have to control the acute congestive glaucoma that's a emergency condition appropriate treatment is controlled now what is the next step what is the next step in the management to prevent such attacks in future a person who is prone to angle closure can develop frequent attacks of acute congestive glaucoma so you should do something to prevent such attacks so what will you be doing right let's go through the choices laser iridotomy in both eyes laser iridotomy in affected eye observation laser trabeculoplasty in the affected eye okay 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 so most of us are on the wrong track my dear friends let me let me tell you let's let's see so first of all most of you are agreeing that we should do laser iridotomy that's right most of you are of the opinion that we should do laser iridotomy okay so what is happening in acute angle closure glaucoma because of the pupil block because of the pupil block the aqueous is not able to outflow so pressure increases whenever pupil is mid dilated the pressure increases to very high level that is acute angle closure glaucoma okay so in these cases the treatment is given in the form of iridotomy what you do you make see what you do you make an opening in the peripheral iris dotomy means making an opening making an opening in the peripheral iris so that there is an alternate way for the aqueous to outflow if pupil block happens again now this procedure can be done in the opd by laser so that is why we call it as laser iridotomy and which laser is used nd yag laser nd yag is the laser which is used now can you tell me which what is the risk factor for acute congestive glaucoma what is the risk factor for acute congestive glaucoma narrow or closed angles okay if a person is having the angle of the interior chamber 
which are narrow or closed these are the people who are at risk of acute congestive glaucoma agree beta because if the angles are narrow then there is a chance of pupil block so and narrow angles is an anatomical feature your both eyes will be having similar kind of angles so a person who develops acute congestive glaucoma the narrow or closed angles will be usually seen in both eyes so both eyes of a patient are at risk so you want to prevent the future attacks so you will do the laser iridotomy not only in affected eye but also in the fellow eye right yes so the iridotomy should be done not only in the eye which presented with the attack it should also be done in the fellow eye also so what will be your answer now beta is there any change in your answer now yes the right answer here my dear friends is laser iridotomy in both eyes okay so answer is a attack can happen in one eye most of the time it is in one eye fortunately right but you must do the prophylactic treatment to prevent such attacks the treatment laser iridotomy using nd yag laser in both eyes right so this goes observation is not right because if the patient develops attack again and again that can lead to permanent glucometer damage laser trabeculoplasty this procedure is for open angle glaucoma cases beta the trabeculoplasty where you apply laser to the trabecular mesh work that is why the name trabeculoplasty so that is the procedure which you do for open angle glaucoma for angle closure glaucoma once again we do laser iridotomy that too in both eyes right okay okay friends moving on to the next question moving on to the next question here right so once again there is an image there is an clinical history so what you will see beta in ophthalmology in your exam most of the time my dear friends whenever you get an image you will also get some sort of history or some sort of point which will let you know about you know how to make diagnosis based upon image right okay right let's let's read the statement a malnourished child is brought now every word you have to see how it is helping you in your you know marking your answer right so what is what kind of the patient it is it's a malnourished child which is brought to iopd by his mother on noticing the given lesion in the eye the mother notices that there is something in the eye there is also history of measles 3 weeks back so this child had measles if left untreated there is high risk of which of the following complication in this case so perfect so all of you have made the diagnosis right okay so a man nourished child with history of measles which is again making him more uh, you know uh, nut uh, with nutritional deficiencies a person who is malnourished who has suffered from a recent viral uh, infection they are often nutritionally deficient okay and this is almost a spot diagnosis this image is almost a spot diagnosis so what do you see here perfect all of you are right all of you most of you are right who is seeing vitamin uh, oh okay you are seeing c right 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 perfect so it's a it's a as all of you have told me bitter spot it's a bitter spot how the bitter spot looks like let's revise it looks like a white foamy spot a white foamy spot on the bulbar conjunctiva mostly temporal side okay please remember a white foamy spot on the bulbar conjunctiva mostly on the temporal side right so this patient is showing signs of vitamin a deficiency vitamin a deficiency and if you do not 
do anything if you do not supplement the vitamin a at this point of time this can progress to yes you're right keratomalacia keratomalacia choice c is the answer because that's the stage with which can lead to the blindness in a child keratomalacia right fine so of course it is not megalocornea is big size of the cornea this has nothing to do with vitamin a deficiency keratoconus again a disease in which cornea becomes conical that is not related to nutritional deficiency neuroparalytic keratitis friends is seen in facial nerve palsy that is seen in facial nerve palsy so here we are looking at a case of vitamin a deficiency who is already showing bitted spot give the treatment now otherwise the child is going to go into keratomalacia and again my favorite chart the zero of thalmia which is all the features which you see in the eye related to vitamin a deficiency friends this topic is a very simple topic but it has been asked almost in every exam your past exams in one way or the other okay. so the first symptom the first symptom in zero of thalmia is your night blindness the first sign which comes up is the corn uh, conjunctival xerosis xerosis means severe dryness of the surface conjunctiva becomes lusterless the next stage is of the pitted spot then there is dryness of the cornea corneal xerosis again if untreated that leads to corneal ulceration which is called keratomalacia in cases of vitamin a deficiency if untreated this can involve whole of the cornea leaving a corneal scar and the changes which you see in the fundus they are called zero ophthalmic fundus okay ji right great moving on to the next question dear friends moving on to the next question are you with me here whose birthday is there happy birthday to the person who is celebrating the birthday so after the session guys please go and have a party okay right moving on to the next question a 25 year old myope is hit on the right eye with a fist following this he noticed flashes and floaters of the light he noticed flashes and floaters of the light guys coming look at the clinical case scenario a person is suffering trauma a person is suffering trauma what kind of trauma the fist injury so blunt trauma then he notices flashes and floaters of the light on waking up next morning there is a curtain like shadow in the visual field of the right eye what could be the likely diagnosis so friends what are the three important symptoms you are noticing here what are the three key symptoms flashes floaters curtain like shadow curtain like shadow so these three please do not forget please do not forget these three key symptoms which a patient will notice flashes floaters curtain like shadow they are premonitory symptoms of retinal detachment retinal detachment right here the trauma here the trauma is leading to the development of retinal detachment so what is happening when there is trauma because of the the pressure changes there can be formation of retinal tear there can be formation of retinal tear which can quickly lead to the development of retinal detachment floaters flashes curtain like shadow almost confirms that this patient is 
developing retinal detachment and the type of retinal detachment which is being developed here is rigmatogenous that's right one of you told ex exudative that's not the right one it is called rigmatogenous retinal detachment right another important cause here it was trauma another important can be posterior vitreous detachment pvd due to old age so pvd trauma myopia these are important causes of development of a retinal tear that can lead to rigmatogenous retinal detachment okay all of you are clear now this can come as an image question also beta so please see i hope all of you are able to identify the tear all of you are able to identify how the retina is appearing detached from its normal position and you should be able to make a diagnosis of rigmatogenous retinal detachment right and the risk factors yes as i told you pvt due to old age trauma and myopia now coming to the next choices here beta vitreous hemorrhage can occur due to trauma but there will not be curtain like shadow in these cases there will be a complete decrease in the vision iridodialysis what is iridodialysis that when the iris detaches from its insertion that will not lead to flashes floaters or curtain like shadow optic tract lesion is very unlikely if somebody is hit on the i it can be optic nerve but of course not optic tract so these are not the right choices right answer here is choice c right perfect okay moving on to the next question dear friends moving on to the next question here ectop when the lens displaces in trauma then it is not called ectopia lentis ectopia lentis is subluxated lens by birth then it is called subluxated or dislocated lens due to trauma okay the word ectopia lentis is used for when it is present by birth not due to trauma if for trauma you will call simply a dislocated or subluxated lens okay great moving on to the next question my dear friends moving on to the next question a one year old child is brought by his parents who noticed white reflex in the left eye lately so a child is showing white reflex in the eye ultrasound b scan of the eye shows presence of an intraocular mass with calcification which of the following statement is not true so classical features of a particular conditions have been described in the question what are those leukocoria okay so what is described here they are telling you leukocoria plus mass with calcification mass with calcification in a child what is your diagnosis wonderful it is retinoblastoma diagnosis is retinoblastoma perfect now which of the following statement is not true let us see what are the statements let's go from below to above there may be risk of optic nerve invasion in this case starting from choice d is it a true statement or false it is a true statement the optic nerve involvement is the commonest involvement in cases of retinoblastoma yes please always see this last line whether they are asking true or not true then choice c presence of flexner wintersteiner rosette on histopathology is specific yes that's true okay. child should be taken up for cataract surgery see here the leukocoria is not due to cataract there is an intraocular mass so this is the false statement choice b is false MRI will be the investigation of choice for further management that is true the best investigation in retinoblastoma is MRI over the CT scan because MRI does not exposes the child to radiation you can look for the optic nerve invasion at the same time you can look for whether there is any pineal 
body tumor or not, the pineal blastoma, which can be in the cases of heritable retinoblastoma. Okay, so all of you agree, beta? CT scan can be done, but MRI is the investigation of choice. So here, the you have to mark choice B as the answer because that is a false statement. Right. So again, my dear friends, please do expect a question from retinoblastoma. So here, classical signs, leukocoria, white reflex in the eye, but at the same time, you have to see the other causes of leukocoria also. It can be cataract, it can be old retinal detachment, multiple list is there. But if there is an intraocular mass with calcification, so mass with calcification is highly suggestive of retinoblastoma. And then the histological feature, histopathological feature of presence of flexner, winter, steiner, rosette. Again, this slide can also come in your exam as an image question. Then you have to think of retinoblastoma. Okay, right? Great. Moving on to the next question, my dear friends, moving to the next question. A simple question. A young man presents with painful red eye. Identify the marked lesion seen on the slit lamp examination. Now, can you tell me the three case scenarios you will get a painful red eye? That is, as I told you, it can be your corneal ulcer or keratitis. It can be acute interior uveitis. It can be acute congestive glaucoma. So here in this case, the patient is having painful red eye. And what are you seeing here? What are you seeing here, beta? This is the slit lamp examination picture. All of you should know when you look at the slit lamp, how to identify the different structures. So here the lesion, this, this part is your, this slit is of your cornea. So do not get confused. And where are the lesions? The lesions, they are at the back of the cornea. This is your iris, right? So what is the lesion? Keratic precipitate. Perfect. So you are seeing some spot, some deposition at the back of the cornea, which are keratic precipitates, which are keratic precipitates. Okay. Yes, these are the big one. They are the mutton fat KPs or mutton fat keratic precipitates, which are seen in the cases of granulomatous anterior uveitis, right? So additional information, mutton fat KPs are seen in granulomatous anterior uveitis. KPs, they usually arrange themselves in, in this ALT triangle. They get deposited in the form of a triangle, which is called ALT triangle. Right? Now coming to what were the other choices, this is not an iris nodule because this is not on the iris. It is on the cornea. Right? This is not a satellite lesion. The satellite lesion is on the epithelial surface. right? And there should be a main big ulcer and then satellite lesion. Satellite lesions are seen in fungal keratitis. Keratic precipitate is the right answer. This is not the bited spot. Bited spot is present on bulbar conjectiva. We have just seen that in the previous question. Okay, right? So taking you around, because these can also be asked that. So what are you looking here, Beta? What is here? What is this? What is this? The lesion marked here. This is your iris nodule, right? This is your iris nodule. Again, what is this? This is your iris nodule. Fine. So here, the iris nodules are shown. The iris nodules, they can be your... Coip nodules, they can be your coip nodules if they are present at the pupil margin. They can be your Bussaca nodule if they are present in the body of the iris. Okay, so these are the iris nodules, Bussaca and coip nodule, again, feature of granulomatous uveitis. Okay. And what are, you, what are you seeing here, Beta? What are you seeing here? 
what what is this kind of lesion what is what are these lesions what is your diagnosis see there is a main ulcer you can see a main ulcer here and you are seeing along with that satellite lesions you are seeing along with that satellite lesions my dear friends satellite lesions which are features of yes which are features of fungal keratitis fungal keratitis okay so please remember iris nodules mutton fat kps features of granulomatous anterior uveitis if the cornea shows a main ulcer along with satellite ulcer most likely it's a fungal lesion and there will be a history of trauma to the eye with vegetative matter trauma to the eye with vegetative matter okay moving on to the next question beta moving on to the next question a patient presents with foreign body in the eye as shown in the photograph which of the following should not be done during the initial evaluation of the patient coming to the next question beta let me tell you lately the questions based upon the trauma to the eye have been examiner's favorite trauma to the eye so here what are they showing the patient is having a foreign body in the eye as shown in the image see look at the image look at the image there is a big foreign body a big iron nail is stuck in the eye so if such a patient comes to you again in the question statement do not miss should not be done so coming to the choice is visual acuity assessment yes you will do it for the kind of like you know the basic baseline vision you will check removal of the foreign body in eye opd will you do that it's very like you know kind of tempting to just pull it out but never never do that never never do that because you will be for causing further injury you do not know how deep the foreign body is and you will be causing further trauma to the eye so never try to remove a deep intraocular foreign body in the opd this has to be done in the surgery theater that has to be done in the operative theater so antibiotics they can be given primary survey you want to check that there are no other injuries but never remove a intraocular foreign body in eye opd okay now in contrast to this in contrast to this if the foreign body is superficial okay if the foreign body is superficial see here so what you will do this can be removed a superficial corneal foreneal body or a conjunctival foreneal body can be removed in the eye opd and how do we remove it normally we use a 26 gauge normally a 26 gauge needle is used yes you put the anesthetic drop you kind of scrape it off from the surface you give antibiotic to the patient so superficial corneal foreign body like this can be removed okay not 16 gauge beta 16 is very thick 26 gauge yes for metallic foreign bodies mri is contraindicated if you suspect a metallic foreign body because that can be displaced when you are doing the mri scan so please remember you know trauma related questions they can be asked in your exam fine okay beta moving on to the next question another favorite topic the question based upon the another favorite topic of the examiner a patient presents with loss of right side of the visual field in both eyes right side of the visual field in both eyes on perimetry the following field defect is noted what is the likely site of the lesion so once again i'm sure all of you have revised your visual field defects of the visual pathway because that's the topic you just cannot skip one question will be coming from visual fields beta okay so 
the patient showing loss of right side of the visual field it means what is the nature of the field defect right sided what is the field defect that is just a second here that is right sided homonymous hemianopia so the field defect is right sided homonymous hemianopia agree beta right sided homonymous hemianopia this is right eye this is left eye the right high half of the visual field is gone that is right sided homonymous hemianopia but do you see something special in this hemianopia in this type of hemianopia do you notice something else you should notice there is macula sparing you should notice there is macula sparing right so it is a homonymous hemianopia with macula sparing homonymous hemianopia with macula sparing okay so homonymous hemianopia without macula sparing is seen in optic tract with macula sparing is seen in optic uh, the occipital cortex when the defect is macula sparing then it is seen in occipital cortex lesions beta occipital cortex lesion so the choice d and c are ruled out we are not looking at optic tract lesion we are not looking at optic nerve lesion so the lesion has to be occipital cortex which one right or left which which should be the lesion beta right or left the lesion will be on the contralateral side my dear friends please remember homonymous hemianopias are always due to lesion on the contralateral side if the patient is losing right half of the field in both eyes the lesion is on the left side bachche some of you are still marking the wrong answer the lesion is on the contralateral side if there is visual field loss on the right half of the visual field the lesion is contralateral opposite what is opposite of right left so your answer is choice a bachche okay your answer is choice a left occipital cortex lesion please i don't want that any one of you should mark the visual field question wrong okay after optic chiasma wherever the lesion is whether it is optic tract whether it is temporal lobe or it is occipital cortex the lesion will be on the opposite side of the loss of visual field so if it is a right sided homonymous hemianopia the lesion will be left okay and you know if it is a macula sparing defect then it is not optic tract then it is occipital cortex okay all of you okay right so quickly revise with me all the visual field defects beta this is this is very very important topic so if if your lesion is in one of the retina or optic nerve that will produced monoocular loss that will produced monoocular loss not in both eyes only in one eye okay if the lesion is in optic chiasma compressing the central part of the optic chiasma then the visual field defect yes agar sparing nahi hota to left optic tract answer hota bilkul sahi <clears throat> so if the lesion is compressing the central optic chiasma you will get a bitemporal hemianopia the temporal half of both the eye visual field is gone okay if the lesion is optic tract here you get homonymous hemianopia on the contralateral side opposite side okay if the lesion is in the parietal lobe parietal lobe then you get pi on the floor again contralateral inferior quadrantopia okay if the lesion is in the temporal lobe you get 
pi in the sky on superior quadrantopia on the contralateral side and if the lesion is in occipital cortex as you are getting here then it is a macula sparing field defect homonymous hemianopia on the contralateral side okay so this figure of the visual pathway lesions along with visual field defect should be in your mind bache okay right moving on to the next question moving on to the next question here a straightforward question which of the following muscle is the synergist of right superior rectus in the movement shown in the image better let's go move on to the next question which of the following muscle is the synergist of right superior rectus in the movement shown in the image so first of all what is happening in the movement both eyes are looking up so which which is this movement that is elevation what is this movement this is elevation of the eye elevation agree so let talk let's talk about the right eye right eye so right eye if the right eye is to be elevated which muscles should be acting which are the two elevators of the right eye bachche what are the two elevators in the eye superior rectus superior rectus and inferior oblique these are the two muscles which cause elevation of the eye okay so in right eye one muscle is superior rectus so what is the other muscle which is causing elevation which is the synergist of this muscle that is choice c right inferior oblique right inferior oblique yes very good yukta synergist is the muscle which is causing the same action in the same eye very nicely put same action they are moving the eye in the same direction and we are talking of the muscle in the same eye not in the other eye that is the synergist okay so some of us we get confused what is synergist or agonist or yoke muscles so please do not get confused synergist is same as agonist synergist is same as agonist okay so synergist muscle or agonist muscle of superior rectus in one eye will be inferior oblique okay so yukta is the birthday girl very good <laughs> perfect so coming here bache when we talk about the synergist muscle or agonist muscle think of one eye okay so superior rectus and inferior oblique will be synergist of in elevation inferior rectus and superior oblique will be synergist in depression or downward movement now all three uh not here sorry now if we talk about the lateral rectus lateral rectus which muscles will be synergist of lateral rectus because lateral rectus causes abduction so obliques obliques which cause abduction will be synergist of lateral rectus okay and for medial rectus the synergist muscles will be superior rectus and inferior rectus superior rectus and inferior rectus for adduction adduction because they are adductors okay so if you remember the primary action secondary action so you have to see which motion they are talking and then you have to pick up your synergist or agonist muscle and the muscle which is causing opposite action will be antagonist medial rectus is antagonist of lateral rectus okay right whereas so let's have a look at the yoke muscles also let's have a look at the yoke muscles also beta whereas so in contrast to the synergist muscles 
the yolk muscles they are the muscles in the two eyes one muscle in one eye one muscle in the other eye which are moving the eye to the same direction okay yolk muscles are when we are talking about the both eyes so for example in left and up gaze the right inferior oblique and left superior rectus will be your yolk muscles okay right similarly for left gaze left lateral rectus and right medial rectus will be your yolk muscles okay right with a junctional scotoma some of you are asking that's usually not asked for the fmg question but it is a kind of scotoma where there is a homonymous hemianopia in one eye and a quadrantic defect in the other eye that's because when the lesion is very close to chiasma the lesion is in the optic tract but the part which is close to chiasma okay but i have not seen junctional scotoma being asked in the fmg exam but it's a defect a homonymous hemianopia and then a quadrantic defect in the other side okay so all of you are now fine with the synergist muscles and the yolk muscles okay so please see what are they asking whether they are asking about yolk muscle or they are asking about the synergist muscle perfect moving on to the next question beta moving on to the next question a simple question but again an often asked question a 6 year old child presents with itching redness ropey discharge all the classic signs are given beta classic symptoms itching redness and ropey discharge absolutely beta main hi bana rahi hu a 6 year old child presents with itching redness and ropey discharge coming on to the question statement symptoms are always worse in the summer season on examination papillae are noted in the upper palpebral conjunctiva what is your diagnosis absolutely right absolutely right very happy all of you know this is a classical clinical picture of vkc classical clinical picture of vkc so what is there a young child symptoms worse in summer seasons all the symptoms of allergy itching redness ropey discharge which is typically seen in vkc and papillae perfect so this is not trachoma in trachoma we do not see papillae we see follicles this is not vitamin a deficiency this is not phylactanular conjunctivitis here you see a limbal nodule the lesion is in the form of a yellowish limbal nodule yes when the appearance is when the papillae are large in size then they give the cobblestone appearance so the question can also come in the form of an image they can show you an image and ask you based upon the history that whether it is a cobble uh, the vkc or what condition so if you see these giant papillae they give the cobblestone appearance when the these papillae are present on the limbus so you see here these lesions when they are present these gelatinous lesion on the limbus these are your horner tranta spot horner tranta spot right and such kind of uh, condition sometimes if it complicates to a corneal ulcer that can cause shield ulcer shield ulcer absolutely right yes in gpc also that is giant papillary conjunctivitis also you see because cobblestone appearance is due to the presence of giant papillae so they can occur in vkc also they can occur in gpc also but in giant papillary conjunctivitis usually the risk factor is the use of soft contact lenses the contact lenses absolutely right absolutely right if they tell you that a 
usually contact lenses are not used by younger children they are used by adolescent or adult people so if the history tells that similar features of redness papillae are there and a person is a contact lens user then your diagnosis will become gpc there will be no variation with the season so the summer season factor will not be applicable in gpc okay so that's fairly simple fine Okay, beta. Moving on to the next question. Moving on to the next question. A sixty-year-old lady who was using glasses for reading is now able to read without glasses. A clinical case scenario. A sixty-year-old lady who was using glasses for reading is now able to read without glasses. Her slit lamp examination shows the following change in the lens. Which of the following is the true statement in this case? Right. So, a lady is in which age group? The lady is in age group of presbyopia. So, a sixty-year-old person will be presbyopic and will be requiring the reading glasses. But now she is able to read without glasses. And when they examine, they find this. So, what is this? The lens is becoming. the lens is becoming yellowish brown yellowish brown so this kind of the change we see when there is a senile cataract and the type of the cataract is nuclear sclerosis nuclear sclerosis yes all of you are marking it right because a similar question came in the past exam also okay so in nuclear sclerosis what is happening beta because of the changes in the lens protein there is increase in the refractive index so there is increase in refractive index of the lens which leads to index myopia right so nuclear sclerosis leading to index myopia results in second sight of old age so in they also mention it as second sight of old age okay so this person who was requiring reading glasses because of index myopia now is not needing the glasses to read but of course the vision for far will be affected okay so what you will be doing shall you be very happy that okay now you not need glasses no because the cataract is developing so the treatment you have to take up this patient for cataract surgery but yes for the time being till this surgery is done the patient has gained second sight of old age okay so coming to the statements the choice a is index myopia due to nuclear sclerosis axial myopia axial myopia is when the length of the eyeball changes so of course cataract is not going to change the length of the eyeball index hypermetropia there is nothing like hypermetropia occurring due to nuclear sclerosis because the refractive index is increasing not decreasing presbyopia due to cortical cataract presbyopia does not happen due to cataract presbyopia is because of the weakness of the accommodation with age okay so again this goes away so as you told me as every one of you told me that this is a case of nuclear sclerosis causing index myopia yes okay right so simple enough moving on to the next question beta a 45 year old lady has developed loss of temporal fields of both eyes which of the following structures may be having a compressive lesion just we revised moments before so a lady developing loss of temporal fields of both eyes okay so what kind of the defect is occurring if this is one eye this is the other eye so supposedly this is right eye this is left eye you divide the visual field into two half temporal half is gone temporal half is gone so this is bitemporal hemianopia bitemporal hemianopia is due to lesion in optic chiasma 
as we know so this will be the chiasmal compression answer is choice d as you have told me and what are the most common causes of chiasmal compression beta pituitary tumors okay pituitary tumors are the most common causes of the compression of the optic chiasma leading to bitemporal hemianopia so question can be asked in any form to identify the visual field defect to identify the site of lesion or to identify the nature of the lesion so pituitary adenoma craniopharyngioma they can be the common tumors which can affect chiasma okay other choices we just revise the visual field defect in optic tract you get homonymous hemianopia in optic nerve lesion only on the one side not on the both sides and in temporal lobe you get a quadrantic defect fine okay bachche moving on to the next question identify the dye used in the examination shown in the given image yes bachche my dear friends quick what which dye is being used in examination shown in the given image is it a sodium fluorescent dye is it methylene blue dye is it a rose bengal stain or a cobalt blue dye so looking at the image here friends looking at the image here looking at the image here so you are seeing this dye is causing a greenish staining of the cornea and you are using yes i'll just tell you in the last bache you can the you know just pass on okay so you are your cornea lesion is stained green in color and you are use checking it under blue light yes so this is your sodium fluorescent dye beta some of you very few of you are telling it as b which is not the answer it's a sodium fluorescent dye okay regarding the sodium fluorescent dye the sodium fluorescent dye is an orange colored dye it is an orange colored dye but when you stain when you stain you examine under cobalt blue filter examine under cobalt blue filter and the lesion will appear green lesion appears green okay so these are the points which will help you to remember uh cobalt blue is a type of filter which is placed on the slit lamp so that helps in projecting blue light onto the eye okay so fluorescent dye originally the color of the dye is orange when you stain the eye surface with the dye and you examine it under cobalt blue filter so that's how why this whole thing is appearing bluish but then the lesion and with the sodium fluorescent dye will stain the areas where the epithelium is abraded where there is loss of epithelium that area will be stained and that area will be stained green in color okay right bachche methylene blue dye is used for capsulotomy it is used to stain the lens capsule methylene blue dye is used to stain the lens capsule during the cataract surgery rose bengal dye is used for dry eye dry eye staining and also for corneal lesions also but mainly for dry eye staining and there is nothing called cobalt blue dye it is a cobalt blue filter okay right bachche okay so my dear friends two weeks from now two weeks from now you will be sitting in your exam you will be sitting in your exam and i just want you to let let you know here that if somebody can do it that's you who can do it okay i'm so happy with the way you guys are answering the questions i'm so happy 
even if you do not answer correctly here you know that what you are going to do in your exam once you have revised here so you can do it have faith in you you have done your preparation and let me tell you preparation is never complete till the end point your mind will always be ye nahi kiya wo nahi kiya forget about that the smart thing to do in the exam is to make best use of what you have already prepared nobody is 100% prepared if i sit in your exam i will also be committing the mistakes so nobody is 100% prepared the smart thing to do is whatever preparation you have done to use it smartly in your exam and how you can do that if you are doing your exam with a cool mind do not let the fear and anxiety overtake you let your mind be cool let it use the preparation which you have done in the exam the things will come to your mind when you will look at the exam questions that yes i read this somewhere this teacher told this this uh, uh, faculty told this use that information and that can be only done if you trust yourself if you stay cool you can definitely do it and i know you will do it okay beta yes all of you will pass you can do it and only you can do it perfect going ahead with rest of the questions let's move every day every day in the mirror from now onwards stand once and tell yourself i can do it and on the exam day you will surely do it okay friends right moving on to next question bachi moving on to the next question what is the most appropriate treatment beta the god challenges you when when you you know kind of taste failure the god is challenging you because he knows that you can do even better than this so challenges aate rahenge life mein this exam is one one thing after exam there will be another challenge in few years there will be another challenge in few years okay nobody is always successful take the failure as a thing that yes god wanted to challenge you because god knew that you are capable of clearing this challenge yes is bar karenge hi karenge so what is the most appropriate treatment for the diabetic patient with 69 vision and the given fundus finding in the right eye so here if they talk about diabetic patient look at the fundus and try to see that are there any diabetic changes in the fundus okay so when you look at the fundus as i told you start from the optic disc so do you see anything in the optic disc in this fundus image beta do you see anything here yes you are seeing this blood vessel growth on the optic nerve this front of the blood vessels which are there on the optic nerve so when these kind of vessels are there on the optic nerve this is called as neovascularization of the disc because these are not the normal vessels these are the new vessels neovascularization of the disc or nvd and if in a diabetic patient we see nvd then what is the stage of the diabetes then it is proliferative diabetic retinopathy okay then it is proliferative diabetic retinopathy so when there is proliferative diabetic retinopathy what should be the treatment the treatment is because even now if the vision is not that bad 69 vision is good vision but these new vessels they can bleed any time they can lead to the loss of vision so we have to treat and what shall we do we should do pan retinal photocoagulation choice d prp laser okay because you want to prevent the loss of the vision that's why when there is high risk pdr high risk means big sized new vessels are there you do the prp 
right? Fine. So diabetic control, yes, of, with, with any kind of treatment, the diabetic control has to be done, but that's not the only thing. No need for vitrectomy surgery at this point of time. Okay, there are different indications. Follow up in three months. If you leave this patient like this, the patient can develop bleeding even next day. You don't want the loss of vision to be occurring. So what you need to do is to prevent the loss of vision, you will do PRP laser. PRP laser beta is done. The retina laser, the laser which is used for PRP is either we are using double frequency, not the ND YAG bache. So that is called frequency doubled ND YAG laser. There is a difference, okay? The PRP is done with frequency doubled ND YAG laser or argon laser, okay? ND YAG is different, which is done for iridotomy or laser capsulotomy. Okay. Now, summarizing the treatment in different stages of the diabetic retinopathy, if it is only NPDR, if there is only NPDR, you will do diabetic control and regular follow-up, regular follow-up. Okay. If it is PDR, the high-risk PDR, like this, then you do PRP laser. If it is diabetic macular edema, if it is diabetic macular edema, then either we do focal or grid laser or anti-VEGF injections. Anti-VEGF injections. And if there are complications like fractional retinal detachment or vitreous hemorrhage, then we need to do the pars plana vitrate. Okay, Bachchan? Right? So this is the summary of the treatment in a case of diabetic retinopathy. All right, Bachchan? Yes, 532 is the wavelength for frequency double NDA cases. <clears throat> yes, the screening is also important. The screening of a diabetic patient for the fundus examination. In case of type 2, it should be done as soon as the patient is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. For type 1, changes they occur usually either after puberty or five years from the onset of type 1. So that is the time when you will screen such patients. Renibizumab, Bivacizumab, these are the names of the anti-VEGF drugs. A Flubercept is another one. Okay, very nice, very nice. Moving on to the next question, Beta, moving on to the next question. A gentleman presents with fleshy growth as shown in the given image. Encroaching cornea and covering pupillary area. What should be the treatment advised in this case? What should be the treatment advised in this case? So again, a spot diagnosis, beta, a fleshy growth, a fleshy triangular wing-shaped growth, which is encroaching the cornea. The diagnosis is pterygium. Yes. So what should be the treatment in this case, in this particular case? Antallergic eye drops? No. Keratoplasty? No. Excision with conjunctival autograft? Yes. Excision of the lesion alone is not preferred because of the chances of the recurrence. So all of you know the spot diagnosis of pterygium. All of you know that what is the ideal treatment. In pterygium, we, the treatment will depend upon if it is a small pterygium. If it is a small pterygium, like, you know, there can, they can also be asking you based upon the type. So type means if it is type 1, because some of you. So small type 1 means. Uh, when it is. 
just kind of involving less than 2 millimeter of the cornea less than 2 millimeter of the cornea okay or it can be type 2 when it is involving 2 to 4 millimeter of the cornea 2 to 4 millimeter of cornea and type 3 when it is involving more than 4 millimeter so when it is involving more than 4 millimeter it is passing the visual axis that is the papillary axis right so depending upon the stage in small this thing you might just observe in type 2 and type 3 the patient can be like you know affected due to the astigmatism when it is touching the visual axis of course it is affecting the vision so at that point of the time you want to remove it surgically and the surgery which is preferred is excision with conjunctival autograft okay, to prevent the recurrence. For a recurrent pterygium, other choices, as you know, you can do conjunctival autograft, you can do amniotic membrane autograft, you can also use mitomycin C. But if they ask you which is the best out of these three, I will suggest conjunctival autograft as the answer because that is easily available as compared to the amniotic membrane and less complications as compared to mitomycin C, right? So some of you, they get this. So mitomycin C is also effective, but autograft is with less complications and good results, right? Okay, Bach. Fine, moving on to the next question. Moving on to the next question. <laughs> Chocolate question. Yeah. A man suffered trauma to the right eye in a road traffic accident and has diplopia and periorbital ecchymosis. Which of the following will be the most likely to have fracture in this case? Again, a common question which has been asked in different ways. Trauma to the eye. And now after that trauma, the patient is having diplopia, double vision and periorbital ecchymosis means bruising around the orbital area. It means there is some orbital injury and they are already suspecting a fracture and they are asking you which will be the most likely to be involved. Yes, so all of you are right. It is A, that is orbital floor. Okay. Because orbital floor is the weakest point of the orbit. Whenever there is trauma, that is the earliest and commonest to give away. Okay. Medial wall is the second most common. Medial wall is the second most common. So orbital floor fracture question again in some form can come there beta. Okay. Yes. So let me show you what happens. What are the clinical signs? What are the radiological signs? So in clinical signs of orbital floor fracture, which is also called as blowout fracture, the patient will have like, you know, swelling around the periorbital area, ecchymosis or bruising. The eye appears as if it has gone backward. We call it as anophthalmos. Okay. And since the floor is involved, this entrapment of infraorbital nerve, which leads to anesthesia of the cheek. Yes, absolutely right. And it also leads to diplopia because there is restriction of the upward movement due to entrapment of the inferior rectus, as well as downward movement. Okay. So there is double diplopia. They call it as double diplopia. There is diplopia in elevation as well as in depression. And yes, classically you see this teardrop sign. Teardrop sign because there is fracture of the floor or vital contents are dropping onto the maxillary end. Okay, so all the points related to the orbital blowout fracture we have covered and this can be asked in your exam beta and you know it all okay fine okay perfect moving on to the next question beta moving on to the next question question number 19 
the given findings are seen in a boy when retinoscopy is done under atropine and at working distance of 1 meter which of the following will be used to correct the refractive error in this case okay so please come to the question you have been given retinoscopy findings here and they have told you that what are the conditions of the retinoscopy finding the retinoscopy was done under cycloplegia using atropine and working distance of 1 meter and this is the finding okay so plus for diopter in vertical meridian plus for diopter in the horizontal meridian so first of all let's see what is the glass prescription here so what is the glass prescription here beta plus 4 plus 4 so under atropine you will subtract one diopter of the cycloplegia so minus one diopter at working distance of 1 meter again you subtract minus one diopter so what is the corrected cross here now plus 2 plus 2 right so at both meridia plus 2 is there so plus 2 diopter spherical will be given there is no cylindrical error so what is the refractive error here hypermetropia very good okay hypermetropia is the refractive error plus 2 diopter so plus lens which is the choice of the plus lens here choice b so you will be giving by convex lens plus 2 diopter of the convex lens is to be given to correct this refractive error okay so i just try to give you this question so that you know how to convert retinoscopy into glass prescription identify the refractive error whether it is simple refractive error or there is an astigmatism and then to know that what kind of lens you will be giving in a particular refractive error Okay. Biconvex lens will be used for myopia. Myopia minus lens, biconcave lens. Convex lens is used for hypermetropia, as in this case. It is also used for presbyopia, plus lens. It's also used for aphakia correction. Biconvex lens. Okay. Plano lens means that there is no refractive error. zero zero powered lens so sometimes like you know people they want to use zero powered lens to look intellectual most of the time and then cylindrical lens is used when there is astigmatism when there is astigmatism okay beta right perfect moving on to the next question an infant is brought by his parents an infant is brought by his parents with complaints of watering and photophobia on examination the following image is seen what is the most probable diagnosis in this case again a classic book picture beta a classic book picture important question has been asked in the all exams many times so a child complaining of watering photophobia the following image is seen what are you seeing in the image you are seeing big sized eyeballs big sized eyeballs big sized cornea in this particular picture the cornea is hazy also the cornea is hazy also so classical symptoms classical signs what are the classical symptoms bpl bpl blepharospasm photophobia lacrimation that is the classical triad of symptoms occurring in the child large sized eyeball with large cornea okay so sometimes the students they can confuse that how to differentiate between megalocornea and congenital glaucoma in congenital glaucoma the eyeball is also big in size not only cornea eyeball is also big in size so that is why it is called bufthalmos big sized eyeball like a bull or buffalo bufthalmos okay so when there is big sized eyeball with large sized cornea then it is congenital glaucoma okay cornea may be clear or hazy 
the pressure will be high okay and you can also see there can be bluish sclera there can be half stria so all these typical signs which you see in congenital glaucoma okay bachche right so here the diagnosis is d it's not cataract it's not megalocornea as i told you in that case only cornea will be large and no symptoms of bpl it is not keratoglobus in keratoglobus the cornea is bulging it is not large size it is bulging okay so this classical clinical picture of congenital glaucoma please do not forget yes the treatment is surgical goniotomy in the cases where cornea is clear trabeculotomy in the cases where cornea is hazy right absolutely right wonderful bit okay moving on to the next question again a simple question but often asked in some way or the other which is the recommended antibiotic according to safe strategy of trachoma safe strategy of trachoma bit of one second you need to give to this and you might be able to get this question in exam and you will answer it correctly safe strategy of glaucoma is a strategy given by trachoma uh, sorry given by who to eradicate trachoma and the antibiotic which is preferred there is azithromycin azithromycin please remember that okay and please remember what all safe strategy stands for s stands for surgery a stands for antibiotic which is azithromycin f stands for facial cleanliness e stands for environmental hygiene environmental improvement to reduce transmission through the flies okay so safe strategy single dose of azithromycin is recommended as per the strategy okay right bas aise hi question aa ja aa jayenge beta you don't you worry aayenge okay so simple things will be asked more often beta simple things will be asked more often fine what is the most likely diagnosis based on the findings shown in the given image okay so see the image try to find what is shown and then we will make the diagnosis then we will make the diagnosis so see here what is being done so look at this picture beta look at this picture this eye is normal this eye is showing drooping of the lid okay and what is the drooping of the lid called ptosis the drooping of the lid is called ptosis okay now what is happening the child opened the mouth and ptosis improved ptosis improved means when the child opened the mouth the lid elevated okay the jaw movement is with the jaw movement is guided by fifth nerve the pterygoid muscles are moving okay the lid movement is by third nerve levator palpebris superioris so what is happening that when jaw muscles are moving the lid the lps is also acting so this is yes this is marcus gun synkinetic phenomena or marcus gun jaw winking phenomena because of the aberrant connection between third and fifth nerve that whenever the fifth nerve is acting the jaw muscles are moving when child is swallowing or eating or doing the jaw movement the ptosis improves so this condition is seen in a type of ptosis which is also called complicated ptosis or marcus gun ptosis or marcus gun jaw winking phenomena okay right perfect so all of you the answer here is choice c so they can give you the image they can ask the what is the type of the ptosis here it's a type of complicated ptosis simple ptosis means when there is no uh, other nerve involvement is just the 
ptosis due to the LPS problem. Okay. Thyroid eye disease does not lead to ptosis. It rather leads to lid retraction. In myasthenia gravis beta, again myasthenia gravis, there are typical features which you see in myasthenia gravis, which I will like to make you revise at this point of time. If there is ptosis due to myasthenia gravis, what is happening? Remember, the ptosis is variable and intermittent because more muscle fatigue is there, the ptosis is more. So less ptosis in the morning, more ptosis in the evening. Then patient also has diplopia because other muscles, they can be involved. Then in myasthenia gravis, the application of ice packs or administration of neostigmin or tens, tensilon, uh, tensilon, that improves the ptosis because you are increasing the availability of acetylcholine. So variable ptosis, which is improved with the ice pack treatment, or with tensilon administration, then you make the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. Okay, so both these are important, bache. Myasthenia gravis, Marcus Gunn, or a simple image test of ptosis that can be given. So you know when the lid is covering more than upper two millimeter of cornea, when it is drooped, your diagnosis is ptosis. Okay. Thyroid mostly adults may hoga, but thyroid is never causing ptosis. Okay, right? Perfect. Moving on to the next question. Bache. Moving on to the next question. Which of the following is not a true statement? So again, when this kind of question comes, always see whether they are asking you to mark a true statement or a false statement. Okay, so let's start from the below. Syringing and probing is the treatment in a two-year-old child with congenital NLDO. So they are talking about NLDO, different statement. Syringing and probing is the treatment if the child age is two-year-old. So is it true statement or false? This is true. If congenital NLDO is not relieved even beyond the age of five years, the DCR can be done. That is again true. DCR is decrocystorhinostomy, the surgery. If the NLDO does not become fine even after five years of age. In DCR, the new opening is made in the middle meatus. That is again true. The natural opening of the nasolacrimal duct is in inferior meatus. But when you are doing DCR, you are creating a fistula between lacrimal sac and middle meatus. Okay. Sac massage is advised for congenital NLDO till age of two years. Now, this is false beta. You do sac massage only if the child ages till nine months. Okay. So, A is the wrong statement here, which is your answer. A very simple protocol of congenital NLDO treatment is there, which all of you should know. Krigler massage or the SAC massage is the preferred treatment till the age of nine months. Syringing and probing is the treatment if the age group is nine months to four year. Nine months beta. Okay. And after four years, if the symptoms are still persisting, NLD obstruction is not relieved, then you do the surgery DCR, the decrocystorhinostomy. This surgery, as I told you, the opening is made in the middle meatus. Right? Okay. So this is the protocol. Simple protocol. Based upon this, just look in the question, which age group is mentioned? And mark your answer accordingly. And mark your answer accordingly. Okay, beta? Fine. Yes, we'll give you the PDF of this question. Are you talking about that? Okay. Right. Moving on to the next question, beta. Again, a simple question. So as I told you, there will be more simple question than the complicated question. And your target should be that never mark a simple question wrong. 
in exam it is the simple questions which help us score it's just a difference of like you know a thin line be attentive in the exam think of the common things first common things are always commonly asked okay yes site for nld obstruction is the lower part of the nld because that fails to canalize at the level of valve of hesner okay so your <clears throat> second last question beta a 68 year old man complains of watering and foreign body sensation on examination the inward rolling of the eyelid margins is noted what is the diagnosis yes a simple statement question you know all these conditions of eyelashes and eyelids inward rolling is called entropion outward rolling of lid margin okay lid margin beta when they are talking about lid margin then it can be either entropion inward rolling or ectropion outward rolling okay if there is problem of the eyelashes so dystichiasis is extra row of eyelashes which is arising from meibomian gland opening that is dystichiasis tracheasis misdirected eyelashes lid margin is okay but eyelashes are interned so that they are rubbing on the cornea so <clears throat> most of us we get confused between tracheasis and entropion entropion means when whole of the lid margin is inroad and in tracheasis when only eyelashes are misdirected but lid margin is in normal position beta okay so i hope you will not confuse between entropion and tracheasis i want 25 questions uh, 20 questions from this beta normally you will get between 16 to 17 questions of of tha so i want all of these should come from here <laughs> right okay so coming to the last question of today's session in which of the following conditions the procedure shown in the image is indicated beta procedure shown in the image is indicated so dear friends have a look at what has been done so what do you notice here beta what kind of procedure has been done are you able to see that there are these semi circular rings half rings which are implanted and they are lying over the iris they are in front of the iris so means they are in the cornea these are your intacts intact rings or intacts which are intrastromal corneal ring segments so these rings are placed within the corneal stroma to support a thinned out cornea now in which of these conditions the cornea is becoming thin all of you are right keratoconus okay because in keratoconus there is progressive thinning of the corneal stroma so you want to support this corneal stroma and which can be done with the use of intacts <clears throat> this is not an iol the the thing which you can get it confused it is with intraocular lens so this is not an intraocular lens because intraocular lens will be completely round okay if it is posterior chamber intraocular lens that will be behind the iris if it is anterior chamber intraocular lens that will be in front of the iris but that will be completely round not semi circular rings so this is not for treatment of congenital cataract or aphakia or corneal dystrophies corneal dystrophies you treat with keratoplasty if they need treatment okay so this is keratoconus right yes agar aphakia hota to it's a <coughs> jet black pupil fine so in keratoconus beta you have to keratoconus again your important topic i wanted to touch upon here in keratoconus the question can be asked based upon the typical features 
that is the signs and treatment okay so quickly revise me, with me what kind of signs you see in keratoconus you see munson sign you see rizuti sign you see oil droplet sign you see flesher ring which is the iron ring in the cornea and you see vogue stria so these are the typical signs of keratoconus okay the treatment of the keratoconus depends upon the stage in early stages you give rigid gas permeable lens in progressive keratoconus we do collagen cross linking which is also called c3r when there is thinning of cornea we do intacts as i showed you when there is scarring of the cornea or the keratoconus is very advanced then you do keratoplasty okay so signs and treatment okay yes so let me just go through the yoke and synergist muscle once more see bit of one thing you have to remember as i told you synergist muscle means that muscle you are talking about the muscle in the same eye okay synergist means you are talking about another muscle in the same eye which is doing the same action so for example for action of elevation for action of elevation the superior rectus and inferior oblique are synergist okay for abduction for abduction lateral rectus and oblique are synergist synergist is also called agonist agonist the same muscle okay so for downward action inferior rectus and superior oblique are synergist or agonist okay right yoke muscles are when you are talking about one muscle in each eye one muscle in each eye so if your eye is looking on the left side if your eye is looking on the left side then left lateral rectus and right medial rectus that is helping to move the eye on the left side so these will be yoke muscles in left gaze okay so these muscles will be yoke muscles in left gaze similarly if the eye is looking in left and up then right inferior oblique and left lateral rectus are the yoke muscles because both these muscles are moving both eyes in left and up gaze okay now for exam in yoke muscle i always tell in the class also there is a very easy way to find yoke muscle so what if they give you that find out the yoke muscle of right superior rectus so just in exam you need not think right superior rectus is leading the eye to right and up direction just do make right into left superior into inferior and rectus into oblique and that will give your yoke muscle okay so right superior rectus the yoke muscle is left inferior oblique for the exam okay similarly if you want to find the muscle for right inferior oblique yoke muscle make right to left inferior to superior oblique to rectus so right inferior oblique and left lateral rectus are yoke muscles so this is for exam okay right fine so my dear friends we complete here the session for ophthalmology and as you know we have tried to cover all the important topics which i expect that you might be getting a question from related to that okay so and i was really happy the way you guys have answered the question believe the questions are going to be like this in and around think of simple things stay cool so that's the most important thing most of the mistakes are made when we are anxious read the statement carefully spend 10 second extra on the question statement what the examiner is asking 
okay don't jump to the choices first of all before marking your choice always read the last statement of the question once more may god be with you always beta may god be with you always best of luck for your exam stay cool you can do it tell yourself at least once a day from now till your exam that i can do it you have done your part you are doing your part nobody can stop you from getting the success you can do it okay right wonderful beta all the very best and of course if you need any further clarification or doubts you can you know send on the telegram groups or on the mail i will try to give answer to your queries as fast as possible and you will be getting the pdf of this session also for your revision all the very best may god bless you and may i meet you soon congratulating each and every one of you on your success all the very best the motivation is from is within you beta all of us are trying to make you believe that you can do it that is the biggest most motivation okay? because we believe in you now you have to believe in yourself all the very best all the very best and yes yukta once again happy birthday give yourself a small party today and maybe a bigger one after two weeks okay bye bye god bless you every one of you see you soon beta